real quick. Can you just thank the band tonight for playing and being us here? Because obviously it's you guys, it's all the glory, but man, just thank you for their gifts and talents for that. Um, very thankful to have gone through this opportunity to just talk about church and we as a church, even though like you, uh, you are a part of the faith family, right? Here at Lake Church, maybe you're a visitor this today, and that's awesome. I'm glad you're here visiting with us. Um, but if you've been here and you have, maybe you were baptized here, maybe you uh, went to VBS and you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior here, maybe you went to camp a couple of years ago because RIP camp this year, but uh, we maybe you accepted Christ there and maybe you've just grown up in the church. So I want you to know as we talk about this that the idea of biblical community is, is oftentimes, I think, neglected because it just becomes routine, right? It just becomes what I do. Uh, on Sunday and Wednesday, but it's so much deeper than that. It's something that God has established for us. And so uh, week one, we talked about biblical community, and then week two, Jetty brought the word and said, man, as we as a community and followers of Christ together, we get to worship, and that's beyond music, right? But when we meet together here, we get to worship, and, um, and, and the church is, like I said, more than just brick and mortar. It's more than this, the, the steeple, right? It's, it's the people. And, and it's the people who uh, who are imperfect, right? Raise your hand if you're imperfect. And if, yeah, absolutely. If you're not raising your hand, you're fibbing, right? You're, we're all imperfect, right? No one is perfect. The only person that can do that is Jesus, right? He was absolutely perfect. And because we're imperfect people, we all need a Savior. And so we're a bunch of ragtag uh, misfits who are imperfect. And we gather together because of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And together, right? Like, just people who are just different from you and don't like the same things as you do, but we still have the same goal and we meet together and we're family and we're on the same purpose. We work together to build relationships, we work together to build one another up, we work together to bring people into the, the, the home, the house of God, to, to tell people about Jesus. We help those in need, we glorify God together, and we strive to be like Christ. We, we share his love with others. And, and this is all, every bit of that, right? The very church, at its very essence, is at the very center of it. It is centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without the gospel of Jesus, we are, we are no longer a church. We're just maybe a group of people who gather together and we put up with one another, right? Like, that's that's what we are without the gospel of Jesus. So if, if anything, anybody, any church turns away from the very essence, which is the gospel, it it, it ceases from being true biblical community, and, and therefore the church turns into uh, turns from its essence from being the church. It's no longer accomplishing the goal that God has established for the church. And so, uh, so that's really where we're heading tonight. Is just some some reasons like why we the church, not maybe not we, right? Because uh, we thankfully we serve at a church that is is gospel centered and centered on God's word, and that's one hundred percent true that Jesus died and rose again. Like we are a gospel centered church, uh, and so but why? So therefore, like Chad, why do we even need to know about this? Why are you uh, talking to us about this tonight? Well, one, it's in God's word; it's in the Bible, so I think we need to talk about it. But two, um, the the Bible says that there is. Uh, this power, this this being, right, a real being named Satan, right? Satan's goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, he he is deceptive, which means he is crafty. We see that in the book of, or in Genesis, right, when he deceived Adam and Eve, and he wants to destroy what God has established and what He has done. Now, because of Jesus and what and His uh, work upon the cross, Satan is vanquished. He is, he is powerless. He, he is destroyed, right? There is no winning for Satan any longer. He is defeated. But Satan, because this earth is still intact uh, until Jesus comes again, Satan is still trying to work in, in my life, in your life, in the life of the church. And so his goal, his desire is to just mess things up as much as he can. And one of the things, one of the, the, the avenues that he is striking and is and even striking hard is the church. Biblical community. And he strikes at the heart of the church because God has established the church, you and I, as, as to move together to forward the kingdom of God, to forward the gospel to the ends of the world so that every nation, tribe, and tongue may know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and King. But Satan will try his best 
to stop it. And so we tonight, and this is the hope, this is the desire to understand that, man, we have got to, to make sure that we are aware of this, we're aware of the schemes, and make sure that we put the gospel first and foremost. Because if we begin to think that there is a better gospel, a better way to follow after, we are sadly mistaken, and we will, we will forfeit our identity as the church that God has established. Uh, many of you may know my wife, Shayla, all right? Uh, she, total babe, right there, that's my wife, Shayla. Love her so much, and so you may know her, I know through like COVID and stuff like that, so we have uh, an 11 month old little boy, Eric Nash. Uh, I call him Nash because that's his little name, just I don't even know if you guys knew that his, so his real the other that little dude. Oh my gosh, it's a fault, squish him. Um, so you may not know, his name is Everett, and we call him Nash because that's his little name. Anyway, by the way, um, so anyway, Shayla, love my wife Shayla, okay? And she, I like, she, I just, she has my heart, like, I love her so much. Um, and if I, t- and I tell her that, right? She needs to know, like, she knows already, but she needs to know more every day. And I tell her, I said, babe, I love you so much. You are amazing, you're awesome. Now, what if I went to Shayla and said, listen, I love you, I love you so much. You know how I got all this love? Can I? There's, there's, there's a, this other woman. Whoa! At that moment, what's she gonna do? Bah! She's gonna punch me in the throat, right? Like I'm not even gonna be able to, to, to move forward in that. No, because why? Because at the very essence of our marriage, right, our holy union together, she is it, man. She's my desire. That's the one I love forever, always, no matter what, right? There is no other woman. There can never be another one, because if there is, the very essence of marriage is no longer there. And so what we want, why I share that is because the church is the bride of Christ, the one who Jesus died for so that he could set up in all of her glory. We are the church, the church here, the church near, the church far, right? We are the church, and far too often within the church, leaders and members alike turn to a different gospel. Turn to a false gospel, one that is one that is pleasing to the ears and easy to swallow and to manage and to live. Because guys, I'm not gonna lie to you, the gospel uh, in its essence of Christian life, it is tough, it is difficult, it is not easy, especially when Satan is constantly attacking us. So the hope tonight, the hope tonight is this is to help us protect ourselves from the attacks of the enemy and the schemes of Satan, and hopefully express the reality of the danger that is all around us that you may face even within the, the, the confines of this church, not by the leadership, hopefully, but by, by people around you who may begin to have their ears tickled by another gospel, maybe even yourself. So we just need to set up these parameters, these boundaries, so that we know, hey, what is the gospel? Where do I need to go? What do I need to, to understand? And what is a false gospel? And because the danger is that Satan will attack. He may attack you, he may attack a church, but we need to know, so we don't want to be drawn away from the true community centered around the one and only gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you're taking down notes, which I highly encourage you to do that, either pen and paper, which is awesome, or your phone, but don't get distracted, please. I ask you that, right? Here's the big idea that we're heading for tonight is this. The church is created and lives by the gospel. That's what we, the church, that's what we're about. Man, we, we are created and live by the gospel. That's why we exist today is because of the gospel. So I want you to open up. So Galatians chapter 1. Woo! Galatians chapter 1. That's time week. It's okay. It's, I know you're back at school and stuff like that. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. If you don't have your Bible, I do encourage you. Go grab one, all right? You can take a moment as you're opening up uh, to Galatians chapter 6. I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. A little bit of a, a context of where we're at, okay? Uh, the, 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 ch- the letter or the book of Galatians is a letter written to the church of Galatia. All right? And, and uh, the church there... Uh, is 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 struggling. All right. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, writes a letter to them, and and he. It's funny because Paul often starts his letters with words of just thanksgiving to the church. All right. He's like, man, I'm so thankful for you. So, for example, the Church of Ephesus, uh, chapter one, verse sixteen, it says, "I do not cease to give thanks to you for remembering you in my prayers always." The Church of Philippi, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, says, Man, I thank God in my remembrance of you. Uh, the Church of Colossae, he says, Man, and, and chapter 1, verse 3, says, We always thank God, the Father our Lord uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for 
you. The church of Galatia, what do you think he says? Check this out in verse 6. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are returning to a different gospel. Paul's like, man, there's no Thanksgiving here. He's like, listen, I'm straight up disappointed in you. All right. Have you ever uh, been with, so your parents maybe get in trouble, and they're like, listen, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Yeah. Like, that's, that, that, that cuts, right? That hits home. You're like, oh, just be mad at me. Grab me. Send me to my room, whatever. Take my phone away. I just go, disappointed. Right? But this right here, man, Paul's like, guys, listen, I am so disappointed. I am astonished. He's like, flabbergasted at what is happening here, all right? I'm sure astonished in the Greek right here means flabbergasted. I have no idea. I didn't have to look that up, but I'm sure it's probably pretty close to that. This is not a normal greeting. What greeting? Why? Because Paul is, is just wants to communicate, guys, listen, what you are doing, turning from a different, the, the true gospel to a different gospel, why? Why? It, it is a really, really big deal. And obviously, I would imagine that the Galatians didn't think that it was a big deal. This is why Satan is so, so scary and so dangerous. He is deceptive. Deceptive means that you don't know that you are being tricked or, or manipulated in a certain way, right? He's deceiving. So Satan right here is deceiving the church of Galatia. And that's why it's not what we want to talk about, because I don't want you to be deceived about turning to another gospel. So this letter, man, right off the bat was was ha had a heavy warning and a plea with the church because Paul was completely sold in for this church. Uh, we don't quite know whether Paul was just a big, like a big heavy hitter for setting up the church or if this was literally like he started this church. We're not 100% sure, but regardless, Paul had a had a hand. He loved these people. They, they were his family and he felt it. So this warning, warning right here is, is that like a parent watching their child run towards the road and a semi-truck is barreling down. Like, that's the, the feeling right here that Paul has towards the people of this church. And just like, oh my gosh, I, I, want to have, I want to help you because danger is coming, right? And so this is the, the context. This is where Paul is, he's just pleading with the church of Galatia here. But why? Because they're turning from a different gospel. And in fact, it says you're, you're not just turning from, from a gospel, because which is like, I think we can often think of just an idea or a concept. It says this right here. I'm astonished that you're so quickly desert, deserting him. Who is him that is Jesus? They are deserting Jesus, who called them in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. So I want us to, to know this. What is the gospel? Right? I think if, if we all want ourselves to know, like, hey, I don't want to turn to another gospel, we have got to know what the gospel truly is. And so for us, we need to state that, what the true gospel is and, and the gospel that we live for and that the church must be about is ultimately this, okay? Write this down, know this, memorize this, okay? This is important. Jesus died for our sins and he rose again. And that's the gospel, right? That is it. That is the gospel. And, and, and we get this from uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1, through, 1, 3, and 4, right? It says, Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, for I delivered to you as first, of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance to, with the scriptures, so stating the scriptures, right, as true and 100% accurate, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures with the scriptures. This is the true gospel. Guys, and we must know that. That Jesus died for your sins, for my sins, that he was raised to life again. Now, in essence, this is pretty much what it's saying, right? If Jesus died for your sins, that means, one, that you, it signifies that you are in need of a Savior. Right? Sins show us our need. Sins show our dependence upon someone to save us. Right? We need that. And then Jesus come to die for our sins, showing that we need a Savior, that he is the Savior, and that he was raised again. Now, this is where it's awesome, because it also signifies that he has power over death and life. He was raised like this shows his authority. This shows his kingship. So we see this, this shows that he is Lord over all. So he is Savior and he is Lord. That is the gospel. Right there. This is what we need to know. This is the only gospel. This is the focus for us collectively as a church, individually as people, and members of the church. So, so why, 
why turn from this gospel, right? Why do we, why do we need to know uh, and be, be uh, just given a heads up about what Satan's going to do? Why turn from this gospel? Because that sounds awesome, right? That sounds amazing. But when we dig deeper, we understand that there's some aspects of it that, that you and I and other people may not be willing to submit to. So why turn from this gospel? This is it. Another truth is this. The desire to avoid sin and to gain control is why most people turn to a false gospel. We see this in Galatians uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Look at verse 7 with me. So Paul says, man, you're turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, right? So he's also saying right here, it's like, listen, you can turn to anything, but it's not the true gospel. There's not another gospel. This is the one and only way. Jesus is the only way. But there are some who trouble you and who want to, to distort the gospel of Christ. The word distort here, all right, it, it has a meaning of, of almost uh, a, another translation could be reverse, right? A reverse. It is a radical change. To distort means to, to change radically, to reverse, meaning that what was set up as last someone puts as first, and what was meant as first, someone has now set up last. But what I mean by that is this. If the gospel it is that Jesus died for our sins as Savior, and, and he was raised to life to signify that he is Lord, this communicates to us that we are saved by grace alone, so that we can do good works for his glory. Okay? That is what the gospel leads us to. Now, those who come and distort the gospel, they reverse that. And you see this in all kinds of different religions, world, other world religions, false uh, churches, and things like that that we'll actually talk about, and, and just people who, who have a misconstrued view of Christianity and the gospel. Because they switch it and they say, you know what, I, I actually need to do good works so that I can be saved. That is a complete reversal of the gospel. And the purpose of the gospel. We are saved, not a part of our good works, but by grace, so that we can do good through the power of the Holy Spirit that now lives inside of us. But the reverse of that is, man, I, if I can just do good enough, if I can just outweigh the bad in my life with the good, then I will be able to receive true salvation. That is a false result of a false gospel. So, what are some false gospels around us? Like, what do we need to be aware of? Well, I want to share with you some ways that Satan has, has tempted the church, right? Uh, he's tempted, like, just, just people who have just gone astray, who have listened, who have distorted uh, the gospel, and has caused drifts from the gospel of Jesus, and how some continue to distort or, or reverse the gospel of Jesus. And so these are these are churches, churches that you can find in America, like the ideas and, and the principles of, of churches in, here in America pro proclaiming something other than the gospel. So one of them is prosperity gospel. I, I don't know if you've heard about that. This is actually a really big thing because ultimately this is what it means. This means, man, if I, if I just, if I'm good enough, I will deserve God's blessing. It, it, it is a perversion of the gospel of Jesus that claims that if you just have more faith, right, more trust, then you'll have more money or wellness health, it's just prosperity. If you, the more faith you have, the more good things you will see come your way. And here's the, here's the bad thing part of this, threat, right? So sin is never discussed. It, it is seen as invasive and distracts from the positive message that a prosperity gospel will try to convey to its listeners. And it seems right. This is why people are drawn to this. It seems right because, man, if, if you, it just seems logical, right? If I give, then I'll get that seems right. If I just give more, give more, then I'll get more, I'll get more. But that, that, is, a, that is a wrong version of the, of the gospel. Because there's ne never any confrontation or confession of sin. Because the individual in the prosperity gospel is the main subject. They're the main point, not God. How can I receive blessing? Not how can I bless God? And so prosperity gospel, liberal theology. Okay, liberal theology, and this is ultimately saying, man, not everything in God's word has to be 100% true. It, it doesn't have to be true in liberal theology. So I'm just going to kind of pick and choose, and I'm going to take the good parts that I believe are true and moral and good, and I'm just going to try to live my life the best that I can. 
And it seems right because ultimately, we like to pick and choose how we want to live our lives. People like that. They, they, they pick and choose, but here's why it's, it's wrong. God's word is divinely inspired. There is no error in this. There is, it is 100% percent true. And it's not a buffet of options, right, that we can choose from. What's true is true. And we need to, to know that. It's inspired by God. So we need to know that God's word is true. We can't pick and choose or erase different things from it. But that's what liberal theology conveys. And moralistic therapeutic deism. Right? That's just a big, big word for a man. Ultimately, God is distant, kind of like Santa Claus. And if I just do good, then I'll feel good. If I do, if I do good enough, and at the end of the year, I right, come Christmas time or whatever, man, I'll, I'll be able to see reap the benefit of that. And and this is saying, man, God does exist. All of these have essences of the of the Christian walk, right? They they believe in in God, a God. They believe in uh, at least some of the Bible. They believe probably in Jesus. Okay, but here's the thing: the moral therapeutic Jesus says, man, there is a God exists. He exists. But if I just if I just am good, which is the moralistic part, in order to feel good, which is the therapeutic part, why well, it seems right? Because man, if I'm good, then why wouldn't God be good to me? That seems right. That's how I would treat other people. So if I'm good, isn't God going to be good to me? Well, here's why it's wrong. This is treating God like Santa Claus, and the Bible says that no one is good, not one. Our goodness only comes from Jesus Christ who through his death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel, he then gives us his righteousness, his goodness. We're not good on our own. Jesus' goodness is then portrayed to us. So, so why are we so drawn to something other than the gospel? Because, guys, here is the truth. It can be so much easier to live life ignoring sin, not having to deal with your shortcomings, your mistakes, and it's easier to reverse the gospel to make good works make sense to save us. It, it, is, it then puts us in control. And how many of you guys love to be in control? Right? Yeah, you can be honest. We love to be in control. How many of you guys like to have your faults pointed out? No, okay, I don't like that either, right? That's why so many people turn to a false gospel. They don't want to confess their sin or have their sins pointed out, and they want control. All other gospels, all other religions place the control in the hands of the people and ignore sin. If we as a church begin to have an improper view of our sin, my sin, my personal sin in my life, and undermine the authority of God, so we strip Jesus away of his salvation, he is no longer Savior if we do not confess our sin or confront or, or confronted with our sin or think that we even have sin. And we know and we take away uh, the lordship of Jesus when we say, you know what, this is this is my doing. I'm gonna do good enough to make sure that I am saved. And if we have a if we're a church with an improper view of sin and undermine the authority of God, we will fail to see the true church or true richness of the gospel, and we will fail to be a true church. And this is exactly what Satan wants to do within the church. He would love to see this. So to be the church that Jesus died to establish the bride that he loved so dearly, for us to be that, we must preach the gospel and the whole gospel. And that is Jesus died for our sins, our need, and, and, and our Savior, and was raised to life. He is our Lord and he is our King forever for all eternity. That is the gospel. So why does this matter to you? All right? You might think, man, try to like, listen, you're not the best preacher, but I feel like you at least share the gospel with us. Uh, Pastor Aaron, obviously, man, he's bringing the gospel every single morning uh, on Sundays. And so why do I necessarily need to even be aware of this or know this or bring, have this brought to my attention? So here it is. Seniors, we, if, if you go off to college, do you know what to look for in a church that you visit on Sunday morning? Do you know if the church is, is preaching the full gospel of Jesus Christ and leading you in a way to, to live out the full gospel? Do you know that, seniors? Anybody else, maybe you have a friend 
who is a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness, and you're like, man, that seems super close to Christianity. Can you spot the difference and know why that is a false gospel? You wrestle maybe with your own desire, your own inward struggle to deny sin, to not confront it, to ignore it, and to take control in your own life and desire to see your goodness as the focal point and your good deeds as the focal point. We want to make sure that we are never, ever drawn down uh, to, to something more, right? Which is a lesser gospel. The tickling of ears, it says in First Timothy 4, 3, man, people just want to have their ears tickled, which means man, they just want to hear what makes them happy. They just want to hear good things and, and uplifting things, and sin does not do that. But we need that. The temptation has been around since the very beginning. Genesis 2, right? This is what happened in the garden. Adam and Eve heard something good from Satan. He deceived them, and man, it sounded so good. They didn't want to deal with the fact that they actually could do wrong. The sin in their life. They didn't want to deal with the fact that, man, there was someone such as God over them. They wanted to take control of their lives. Sin entered into the world. So here's the last thing. Guys, if we, if we want to make sure that the gospel and that we're living a, a, the way as a church that, man, God has ordained us to and established to be, we must be gospel-centered, not self-centered. And then we see this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. It says this, for, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of God. Christ. Jesus is the head of the church, and the gospel is at the very heart of the church. The danger is that we become self-seeking people pleasers. That is the danger. This is why many turn to a false or incomplete gospel. The main hang-up on the gospel is our is often our own desire, like I said, to, to, to ignore sin and an unwillingness to address it and to confront it. And many churches don't want to address it either for the sake of hurting someone's feelings. You already saw a picture of my little dude, Nash. Um, I, I love this dude. Man, he's going to be a year on October 9th. That's crazy. That, like, blows my mind. And uh, but he's in the stage of thank you, thank you. He's in the stage of life, though, where it does not matter what it is. He will pick it up, and he will put it in his mouth. Right? Food. Inanimate objects, stuff that he should not put in his mouth, right? And he puts anything and everything in his mouth to eat it, right? Including like like little grains of rice. I don't know how he finds it. He's better than a vacuum cleaner. He finds this little grain of like rice on the on the ground and he'll put it in his mouth. He'll find a leaf on the ground, he'll put it in his mouth, a blade of grass. Yeah. And uh, but he'll also put like uh, electrical cords and stuff like that. Things that are dangerous, okay? Now, what if Nash He's, he's like, man, that sure, that like poor that sure tasty, my, 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 right? Puts it in his mouth. And, and that would be dangerous. What if I said, you know what? I just I don't want to upset him. I don't want him to cry. So I'm just, I'm just not going to say anything. What kind of father would I be? A horrible Yes, a bad one, right? The police should come to my door and take him away from me if that was the case. That'd be awful, right? I should, that, would be, that would be not a good thing to do. That'd be awful because it puts him in danger, and I saw it coming, right? So here is, is the thing with that. Like Paul is telling the church in Galatia, we must make sure that, man, we don't want to worry about upsetting somebody. We don't want to worry about, I, I'm, listen, I will, I will call you out on your sin, okay? Because I want you to do that to me. We need to call each other out on our sin because that's what the church does. That is the gospel because we have to acknowledge that sin is evident and in our lives, but the forgiveness of sin is extremely available to each and every one of us who will place our trust and our hope and our faith in the Savior Jesus Christ who died for our sins and who rose again three days later to defeat sin and death and rose victoriously as King, as Lord, as Master, as the one who is almighty over all creation, including you. Whether you believe it or not, whether you have submitted to him or not, guys, he is king over you. And one day, each and every knee will bow. But I want you, students who are here, because guys, listen, I, I love you guys like crazy. 
And I want you to know that when that day comes, when you're going to stand before Almighty God and you're going to say, God, here I am. And he's going to say, why should I let you into my kingdom? And I want you to know because it's because Jesus Christ died for your sins and was risen from the grave. Not because, God, I did a lot of good things. Man, I, did, I, I, I tried my best, God. No, that is a false gospel. And that will get you nowhere except eternity separated from God. And I do not want you to spend eternity there. I want you, just like God wants you to spend eternity with him in, in, in heaven. Because of Jesus, because he is Savior, because he is Lord. And I want you to know that. The gospel must be our focus. You individually, us as a church, we must know that Jesus died for our sins and he rose again to defeat sin and death. And we must look up and we must behold the fullness of the gospel so that we can live in the true light of the gospel, which is in the community that God has established for us. So I want you to take away this, right? I want you this, this to be your takeaway. What we become is what we behold. We become what we behold. We become what we look at most. If you if you uh, overeat, right, you become gluttonous. If you become material, like just want stuff and stuff, you become materialistic, right? You become what you behold. So I want to ask you, what do you behold? Is it the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is it something every day that you're like, God, I want to obey you, and so I confess my sin. I, I want to confront it. I want to I want to put it to death, and I want to live for you as the master, the Lord, the King over my life. So may we be a people, a church, a student ministry that impacts the community for the gospel of Jesus Christ that is constantly beholding the gospel and lifting it up high as the one true only gospel. I'm going to ask Jetty and to come back up to play. And we're just going to sing one more song, but I want you during this time as I want you to, to think, do I believe that Jesus died for my sin? Do I believe that he rose three days later to defeat sin? Do I believe that Jesus is my Savior? Do I believe that Jesus is Lord currently right now over my life? Do you believe that? Do you need to address any sin that is in your life? Do you need to let go of your pride and your arrogance and release control, saying, man, I cannot do good. I need, to be, I need Christ to be my good. I need Christ to be my righteousness. What is it that you need to confess to God tonight? To receive the full weight of the goodness of the gospel, we must address our sin before a holy and righteous God who has all authority over all creation, because only then can we fully understand and rest in the grace of the gospel. There is rest to be found for those who are weary. What do you need to give up tonight? What do you need to confess? Maybe someone in this room tonight needs to say, I need the gospel. I need the gospel. I need to accept Jesus Christ that he died for my sins. I need to accept that he is the Lord of my life, that he rose from the grave. If that is you tonight, there are adults here who would love to talk to you. Myself, just find somebody in the back. Find your small group leader. If you're here, talk to somebody. Talk to somebody tonight. Because I do not want you to leave this place. Because we, we, we have been given the full, the full reality of the gospel. So what will you do with it now? What will you do with it? God, we love you. Lord, thank you. Thank you, God, for the gospel. Thank you for, for Jesus Christ who died for my sins, who took my place upon the cross, who, who died my death that I should have died. God, I'm the sinful one. Lord, I should have paid the price. He was perfect, and in his righteousness and his goodness, he took my place so that I can now live. And he defeated sin and, sin and death when he rose three days later and, and revealed himself to the world, to the entire creation, heaven and earth, that he is king. God, and we release control to him. 
Because when we try to try to take control, God, it is useless. It is a it is like running on a treadmill, going nowhere. We strive and strive, and we can do nothing. God, it is your grace that saves us. It is by your mercy, God, that we receive, that we can enter into salvation and eternity with you. Lord, and I, I just want to convey and express a plea, God, if there is any heart in here tonight that has not rested in the full weight of the gospel and received Jesus as Savior and as Lord, I pray that tonight would be the night. God, that you would bring them into your salvation, that you would speak to them, and that you, God, would save them. It is not of our own doing. It is not of our goodness. God, it is your goodness. And we are so thankful for that. God, may we be a church that knows the gospel, lives the gospel, that Christ died for our sins and rose again. And it's in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.